Well, we have a real treat for you this afternoon. Steve Scalar, who is a uh, immigration attorney during the day, and he is a volunteer Henry George teacher and lecturer in the city of New York. He's a second generation Georgist. His mother's a Georgist. His father was a Georgist and also a volunteer teacher of Henry George. And Steve's talk today is going to be about how we should live. <coughs> dog eat dog uh, competition versus the vision of Henry George. Let's welcome Steve Scalar. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings. Hello, everybody. So uh, a number of years ago, my wife and I, who were law students at the time, took a course on moral responsibility for lawyers, if you can believe that. <laughs> uh, the teacher, Daniel Cocolette, told us a story that was relevant to the class. He said that one day he was stuck in traffic in a line of cars up in Boston. And um, another car kind of zoomed up alongside the line and cut in a ways ahead of him. Uh, Cocolette, who for what it's worth was raised as a Quaker, uh, got out of his car because nothing was moving. He went up to the line cutter's car and he said, <coughs> said to the man, you know, you can only do that because the rest of us are sitting here patiently waiting our turn. So tonight I want to talk about two uh, worldviews of how we can wisely or most wisely live in society. One might be called the dog-eat-dog -dog view and the other the cooperative view. Uh, so as far as the dog-eat-dog -dog view is concerned, that's the view that uh, opportunity is inherently limited, uh, that uh, life is winners and losers, and the thing to do is to be a winner at all costs, and if that hurts other people, so be it. Wolves and apes have their alphas, and so do we. Be an alpha. That's the doggy -dog, dog view. The other view, the cooperative view, is nicely expressed by the emperor Marcus Aurelius, who said, people are made for cooperation, like the eyelids, like the upper and lower rows of teeth. Uh, particularly in this moment, this period of time that we're living in with, with the rise of the strong man around the world and uh, kind of a rise of tribalism. Uh, you may or may not feel you can see that, for example, in the impeachment proceedings, but it's available elsewhere. I think it's particularly important to consider the respective merits of these two views. Uh, I'll also say that uh, considering them and weighing them, for me, has some relationship to what can be called the poverty problem that Henry George dedicated his thought and his life to. And uh, just a reminder of what that is, uh, as George formulated it, it's the question, how can it be, you know, why does poverty persist and even deepen as civilization gets better and better able to produce wealth? Uh, so first, let's talk about the dog-eat-dog -dog view. And I want to say, uh, so here you guys are, all of you, on uh, Sunday afternoon listening to a talk about this subject. I'm just going to go out on a limb and take a wild guess that there's probably not uh, heavy leaning, at least in how you think of yourselves, towards the dog-eat-dog -dog side. Um, I would think that no really self-respecting person trying to be top dog ruthlessly is going to be attending a talk on a Sunday afternoon. Um, may maybe, maybe you'd be playing a little golf or maybe something with a little more teeth in it, but I'm just going to guess that. So what I'll try to do here is I'll start with dog eat dog and I'll try to make a, a, a strong a case for that being the way the world works. And I thought I'd pause for a second, uh, you might find this interesting, to just con consider a little bit the history. I did all of a few minutes of Googling to find out the history of the phrase dog eat dog. Uh, apparently, the first appearance of it, or a reference to it in English, was in 1543. 
uh, a reference to an older Latin saying caninum non caninum est, uh, which uh, the English version in 1543 pointed out meant uh, dog does not eat dog. Est in that Latin phrase doesn't refer to the verb to be, it refers to eating. Um, so the, the original idea before it sort of the way language is, it sort of changed over time was that dogs do not eat each other, which seems reasonably accurate. Dogs are not especially cannibalistic. They may fight each other, but they're, you know, a pack animal. Uh, and then in 1732, there's another reference, uh, a, a bit of writing in England that was, um, dogs are hard drove when they eat dogs. And that introduces an interesting element. So the natural order, dogs don't eat dogs, but uh, it suggests that under duress, under some kind of a pressure, they may end up eating dogs. And then we, we come to today. I don't know what writing has been in between then and now, but we basically use the phrase to mean you know, it's a stand-in for sort of ruthless competitive behavior, a winner-take-all, winning at all costs. That's how we use the phrase. So it's just kind of, I thought, if nobody else does, I thought it was a little interesting that the origin was almost, it came from the opposite end of the spectrum, but that's not how we use the phrase. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, George, in his seminal work, Progress in Poverty, considers a couple of theories that can also be viewed as sort of justifying and underpinning and being a basis for a worldview that dog eat dog is the way to live smartly in society. Uh, the wages fund theory, the Malthusian theory, and I'll just run through these quickly. Uh, the wages fund theory, according to George, he, he has an observation that not everybody, uh, you know, that, that it's, it's popular, it was popular in his day to explain the existence of the poverty problem, but it's popular, uh, was popular then and continues to be popular today among people who, for the most part, have not ever heard of the phrase the wages fund theory, have never read economics, and who could blame them? Uh, but the basic theory posits that wages that are paid to laborers, uh, the ultimate source of wages is a fixed fund of capital, relatively fixed at any given time in society. Um, and there are some corollaries to this view. If you believe that the wages, uh, the compensation paid to workers, uh, ultimately the source is a fixed fund of capital, a uh, corollary to that is uh, a kind of, you know, underpinning of a dog-eat-dog -dog view because one offshoot of that is that if, if there's just a fixed pool, then the more laborers you have in the pool, the less would be available for, on the average for any given laborer. You can think of it as uh, similar to a pie. Uh, the more people are at the table to share the pie, the less pie available on the average for any given person. Uh, another offshoot of that, which is familiar to people like myself who are immigration lawyers, uh, but uh, uh, people in general, is the phrase that you may have heard or may even have used yourselves, um, they're taking our jobs. Uh, there may be other reasons to believe uh, that that is a threat, but I think ultimately at bottom that's a feeling that there are only so many jobs to go around. Uh, so that's one view of the world that could justify a feeling that everything is inherently dog-eat-dog. -dog. Uh, another theory that uh, George looks at is the Malthusian theory. Uh, after Thomas Malthus, who wrote in the 1700s, he was an English, I think English, Scottish, I don't know, cleric. Uh, and he wrote an essay on population, uh, which is still, you know, his thinking is still quite um, popular among many people today, which essentially suggests that human population, by the operation of just nature, that this is nature, has a tendency to increase faster than our ability to get uh, subsistence from nature. So to Malthus uh, and that theory, the theory that population and overpopulation is at the root cause of poverty, that's, that's another answer to the poverty problem. And there are a number of things that flow from that. One is that, in a sense, uh, it suggests that nature is uh, to blame for 
poverty, and it also sort of points the finger at other people as, you know, and sort of buttresses the wages fund theory um, and, and makes it out that uh, people are in some ways our enemies, other people, uh, when it comes to wages and prosperity on the, on the average. Uh, another theory that uh, George looked at at the beginning of his book, Progress in Poverty, is uh, the theory of diminishing returns in agriculture, which overlaps a lot with the Malthusian theory. And it's the idea that as, as things get more crowded, more people in a system, we get, uh, due to the natural laws, we get uh, less and less efficient at producing subsistence through things like agriculture, that, that uh, nature uh, gets more stingy the more people there are. Uh, involved in that activity. This is something that I think John Stuart Mill was a proponent of, and George was a great admirer of Mill, particularly early in his career before he had his great central insight about the poverty problem. So these theories, uh, I, and I'll, incidentally, I think they support another view which is more modern, which you can think of Ayn Rand and the idea that greed is good. Um, Ayn Rand, sort of the darling of uh, federal government financial policy makers since at least the time of Clinton. Um, in any event, uh, I put it to you that if you feel that these different uh, sort of mutually supportive theories do kind of uh, validly explain the workings of the world, particularly in the economic aspect, um, that uh, you, you kind of have to give a certain amount of credence to the thought that the world is inherently dog-eat-dog, -dog because that worldview is kind of implicit in these theories. Um, George has a nice description when he describes uh, a certain kind of ruthless and dog-eat-dog -dog behavior. Uh, his words, as is so often the case, are better than mine, so I'll read you a little excerpt of something from Social Problems, another book of his. Um, he says that he who produces should have, that he who saves should enjoy, is consistent with human reason and with the natural order. But existing inequalities of wealth cannot be justified on this ground. As a matter of fact, how many great fortunes can be truthfully said to have been fairly earned? How many of them represent wealth produced by their possessors or those from whom their present possessors derived them? Did there not go to the formation of all of them something more than the superior industry and skill? Such qualities may give the first start, but when fortunes begin to roll up into millions, there will always be found some element of monopoly, some appropriation of wealth produced by others. Often there is a total absence of superior industry, skill, or self-denial, and merely better luck or greater unscrupulousness. So I think that's relevant to what we're talking about today, because if your worldview, if your, if your impression, your understanding of how the world works as far as economics is concerned and wages uh, and poverty, then I put it to you that you have to at least pause and maybe admire the unscrupulous millionaire, or as we would call them today, billionaires, because a million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to. Um, and, 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 and if that's your worldview, if you believe that is the way things are, you know, they, they, if you follow uh, Sergeant Krupke, I think it was, in uh, West Side Story, and you think things are tough all over, and, and they're tough because it's inherent in the way things are, that people are sort of pitted against each other. It really is a social Darwinistic world where it's all about the survival of the fittest. Then the flip side of that is not only do you have to kind of validate the top dog in a way, um, but you you know the flip side is that you have to feel uh, sort of persuaded by certain billionaires who are, would be eager to remind you of this that it's really um, if you don't have that attitude you're a fool you're a you're a sucker you're a patsy okay so that's making a case for a dog eat dog. We'll come back to it. But now I'm going to go over to the cooperative side. And on that, I want to say that George, um, I'm happy to report, because I want to find cooperation 
uh, in the way that the world works. George debunks these theories early on in Progress and Poverty. It's, it's kind of the first subject he tackles after the introduction to that book. Um, he, uh, you know, as far as the wages fund theory, uh, he essentially shows that that is a, a flawed and completely fallacious theory by talking about the actual nature of capital and its role in um, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, generation of wages and, and also the way that uh, wealth is actually produced, the source of wages. Um, he points out that capital is just a subspecies of wealth. It's wealth that's set aside for the production of more wealth rather than being consumed by the ultimate consumer. And he also reminds us that there are three factors to the production of wealth, land, labor, and capital. Labor being the exertions of human beings acting upon sort of the natural substrate, natural resources, which uh, is land in the economic sphere. Um, and capital is a species of wealth that's held sort of aside and used for the production of more wealth. Think of the tools of a workman in construction, maybe uh, machinery and a factory, or, or even the funds that are uh, you know set aside for the payment of salary in a uh, in in many an, an enterprise. Um, so you know George points out that the inherent nature of capital and ha and the actual ultimate source of wealth, which is labor, essentially um, uh, contradict and and kind of defeat the wages fund theory. And yet he points out that the view. Uh, that wages come from a capitalist fund of capital persists in our belief, even though reality would suggest otherwise. And he says this is understandable because in most, uh, you know, in many, maybe most employment, most uh, work that people do, they're employees in a company, and your immediate salary comes, you know, in a paycheck from payroll. Uh, so it's plausible if you don't think about things on a, on a further and deeper analytical level. Um, and here, I think it's worth reading another quote from Henry George uh, that's on that point. He says, many people think and talk about uh, uh, as though the trouble is that there is not enough work to go around. Here he's talking about the sort of confusion of uh, employment and, um, and wealth, in a sense. I mean, he's, he's basically talking, getting at the point that we, we don't generally work simply for work's sake. We work in order to get the things and produce the services that work is needed to produce. Uh, so he says, you know, people talk as if there's not enough work to go around. Um, we are in constant fear that other nations may do for us some of the work we might do for ourselves, and to prevent them, guard ourselves with a tariff. We laud as public benefactors those who, as we say, furnish employment. We are constantly talking as though this furnishing of employment, this giving of work, were the greatest boon that could be conferred upon society. To listen to much that is talked and much that is written, one would think that the cause of poverty is that there is not enough work for some many people, and that if the Creator had made the rock harder, the soil less fertile, iron as scarce as gold, and gold as diamonds, or if ships would sink and cities burn down oftener, there would be less poverty because there would be more work to do. So he's pointing out, uh, you know, how it's, it's easy to be sort of uh, diverted from the reality of the situation by a kind of superficial view of things. Turning to Malthusianism, um, which, you know, uh, you may not hear on a daily basis, that multisyllabic word. And there goes another one. Um, George points out a number of fallacies in that theory. Uh, he, he sort of points out a mathematical kind of fallacy in Malthus's reasoning. So Malthus said that population would double every 25 years. He's very clear about that. And George looks at this and, and basically says, well, where, where does he get that from? I mean, the 25 years is a reasonably good guess as to the you know, amount of time between generations. No problem there. Um, he also uh, figures out that you know, it's, it's clear that Malthus is assuming that you know, the two people, man and woman, uh, you know, produce children. 
um, and that they're going to have four children. Okay, so that's an assumption. So think of it this way. You have, I'm going to draw a picture in the air. You have two couples, so four people in the first generation, and each of them have four children, so now you have eight. And then there's a certain amount of inter marriage, interbreeding, if you will, to produce uh, the next generation. And according to Malthus's assumptions, that would be 16. So you have like 4, 8, 16, 32, and a kind of a geometric expansion as you go down the generations. That's Malthus's assumption of things. But George points out that this is fallacious reasoning uh, in a way sort of based on the fact that Malthus is taking too narrow a view of the generational map. George has a nice phrase for this. He says something like um, that a man may have children is problematic, by which he means uncertain, but that he had to have had pa two parents is certain, and those parents had parents before them. So if, if you basically take what George is saying and take it upwards, uh, two people at the beginning, let's say, they each of them had two parents, so now you have four, each of them, you know, to the grandparent level, eight, and you have a doubling as you go up, two, four, eight, 16, 32. It's basically Malthus's view flipped. Um, but, the, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you think about it a little further, the, the true generational sort of diagram or, or map would be more like a lattice. You'd have, you know, intermarriage and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so it would be like a sort of net curtain, you know, diamonds just sort of going down. Now, uh, it's also, the Malthus, Malthusian theory is also kind of refuted by facts. We have had population growth in the history of, of, of the Earth, uh, but it has not been anything like a doubling every 25 years, and Malthus is clear saying it has to be. George points out that you can have periods of famine, war, and things like that. And the other thing that George points out is that Malthus was wrong about the effect of increasing population on our ability to produce wealth, whether it's agricultural or other types of wealth, the fact of the matter is that more population as a society and a community get more settled and developed uh, it makes us more able to produce wealth, not less. So he's debunked that theory and similarly the theory of diminishing returns in, in agriculture. And as far as social Dar Darwinism is concerned, George points out that uh, it's basically based on the assumption that people are like other organisms, that we're like rabbits or microbes, that we, uh, if we you know, over sort of populate, we use up the resources that we need to survive on. But George points out, I think quite rightly, that people are not like other organisms in that we have reason and the ability to not be passive as far as the forces of nature, but to marshal them. Uh, he has a very nice phrase about this. It's kind of punchy. I never would have thought of it myself. He says that the more Jayhawks, the fewer chickens, but the more people, the more chickens. So that's why I should always be talking about using George's words when I can for these things. Um, so, you know, but uh, let's, let's again go back to the idea of this dog-eat-dog. -dog. Fine, we have a refutation of the worldview, but there's still more to be said on the subject, the kind of weighing of the two views. Um, again, dog-eat-dog -dog behavior persists. Uh, it's been around a long time. Uh, again, in this moment, sort of politically around the world, it feels like a, a, a sort of validation and an activation of that kind of behavior is very healthy. And so why? So it, I think it pays for me to consider another thing that George says that sort of affirmatively makes the case for just how cooperative inherently society is, lest we forget that, and it's easy to kind of forget that nowadays. Uh, it, this has to do, he, he particularly does this in his book, The Science of Political Economy, his last book at the end of his life that he wrote. Um, and and it's, it's his discussion of the role of cooperation in how people produce wealth that I find particularly kind of interesting and relevant here. Um, he, he goes through some fairly standard 
discussions of how wealth is produced. Uh, he talks about the multiplication of labor, how people can work together to do things that no one could do uh, on their own, such as raise, barn raising or log rolling, that kind of thing. Uh, he talks about maybe even more important the division of labor that you might see in an automotive assembly line. Uh, or you can see it uh, more informally throughout the fabric of any even partly developed community where people, uh, by, by being able to sort of trade and exchange the results of specializing in things that may play to their strengths, their aptitudes, uh, and thereby uh, collectively as a group be much more productive in the production of wealth than they would otherwise be. But there is another dichotomy between what uh, could be called directed cooperation and what George calls spontaneous or unconscious cooperation that uh, I think is really much more insightful for the purposes of what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, George's insights there are worth reading. Uh, after marveling in the science of political economy about the way that directed cooperation enables a crew to sail a fully rigged clipper ship as if it were a bird in flight, George describes the even more impressive role of unconscious or spontaneous cooperation in the building of such a ship. Uh, I'll read you that. Uh, it's worth it, I think. Consider the timbers, he writes, the planks, the spars, the iron and steel of various kinds and forms the copper, the brass, the bolts, screws, spikes, chains, the ropes of steel and hemp and cotton, the canvas of various textures, the blocks and winches and windlasses, the pumps, the boats, the sextants, the chronometers. When a shipbuilder receives an order for such a ship as this, he does not send men into the forest, some to cut oak, others to cut pine. He does not direct some to mine iron ore others copper ore and others lead ore, some to plant hemp and some to plant cotton. Nor does he attempt to direct the manifold operations by which these raw materials are to be transformed and assembled in the place where the ship is to be built. What he does is to avail himself of the resources of a high civilization and to make use for his purpose of the unconscious cooperation by which without his direction or without any general direction, the efforts of many men have brought together the materials and productions needing, needed for the putting together of such a ship. A modern ship, he writes, like a modern railway, is a product of modern civilization, of that correlation of individual efforts in which what we call civilization essentially consists. A mere master of men, though he might command the services of millions, could not make such a ship unless in a civilization prepared for it. A pharaoh that built pyramids, a Genghis Khan who raised mounds of skulls, could not do it. Well, that account of shipbuilding has paid dividends for me. Once I became aware of it and read it, uh, I'm now able, when I want to, to look around and see signs of that myriad types of uh, things that are produced by that kind of cooperation. Uh, the buildings like this one, the food that we eat, the cars on the road, our cell phones in our pockets, or the wireless networks that make them functional, to say nothing of services that we exchange in restaurants, hospitals, schools, or the arts, uh, show that cooperation is not just the occasional random act of kindness. It is ubiquitous, routine. Now, I gave a shorter version of this talk a couple of years ago uh, on the occasion of Yom Kippur. I was invited to, or allowed to speak in front of a congregation on this subject. And you might say, wait, he gave a short version of this talk, so why do we have to listen to a longer one? But you did invite me, so, you know, and you said I could talk at length. So I guess you have only yourselves to blame for that. In any event, Here's how I ended that shorter version of this talk. I said, nearly all of us have incentive to cut the line, yet instinctively nearly all of us understand the value to each and all of us of taking our turn in traffic. We are not so much about the cutter, 
We are all about the line. I find it especially heartening these days to consider that our nature is far less dog-eat-dog than the fearmonger would have us believe. We may share combative traits with apes or wolves, but thankfully we are, most fundamentally, cooperative. Okay, and yet, I mean, that's where I ended that talk then, but this kind of lengthier version uh, I've had more time to think about it, and as I was getting ready to give this talk, maybe because I had been watching the impeachment hearings, uh, heard Jovanovich speak, and it, this put me in mind of the corruption that she referred to in, the, in Ukraine, uh, and also you may or may not believe corruption is here in this country and elsewhere around the world. And it, that started me, you know, thinking that it really does, as I said earlier, seem as if doggy dog behavior in a way is on the rise and is very healthy, if I can use that word, around the world. This, this attitude, uh, they're taking our jobs or us versus them, uh, winner take all mentality has seemingly never, at least in my lifetime, been stronger. Uh, and if you believe, as I do, that we are primarily, as a species, cooperative, uh, this really kind of gives rise to what we could call the dog-eat-dog -dog problem, which is to say, why, what about that? What, you know, what, what's up with that? Why, why is this persisting and, and why is it so strong in so many areas these days? Uh, I have a theory. I don't know how original or brilliant it is, but it seems to me that uh, one thing that accounts for why we would act that way against our better collective nature is that you know when we when individuals come to feel uh, afraid when we when we fear and uh, maybe most specifically we fear poverty the chasm of poverty can come to yawn sort of beneath us uh, and if and particularly if that's coupled with a sense of an injustice of being treated unfairly. Uh, I think that kind of thing brings out the dog-eat-dog -dog in us. Uh, and, and I have, thinking about it, I have a trivial personal example of that and a less trivial, not personal example. First, the trivial and personal one. A uh, number of years ago, I managed and played for a men's over 40 soccer team, amateur team, um, and, and, and playing in New Jersey. And, and one game we had a player, a strong player of ours, who was red carded and ejected from the game for fouling another player. Uh, the other player had committed the infraction first, but it was our player and his retaliation that the ref saw, which is often the case. And so he was ejected from the game, but also suspended for three games. He got a three game suspension, which I thought was harsh. So as the manager, I decided to argue his cause, his case. I went, uh, took a long drive up to the league meeting where there was a meeting of the rules committee to argue for a less lengthy suspension. Uh, it was a long drive and the committee made me wait 45 minutes before they deigned to hear me. And at that point they asked if I had brought the player with me to argue the case. And I said, no. And they said, well, then there's nothing we can do. The three-game suspension stands. Uh, I was very angry about that. I drove home, the long drive home. You would have seen me muttering and sputtering and cursing to myself alone in the car. Uh, make of that what you will. Um, but uh, the point is, uh, well, I also vowed to get even. And uh, as P.G. Woodhouse would say, if any of you are fans of Woodhouse, uh, at that point, to forge a player's pass was for me but the work of a moment. And that's what I did. I uh, took the picture of our suspended player, uh, put that, pasted that onto another absent player's pass. And so uh, our player, our suspended player, played for those three games under a different name. It's not pretty, but uh, this is this is who you're dealing with here. Uh, the point here is that I like to think of myself, and I think I pretty much am, uh, 
uh, a respecter uh, very wholeheartedly of the rules of the game. I think that's what makes uh, sports and a lot of, other, a lot of other endeavors in life uh, worthwhile and uh, is, is crucial to uh, their enjoyment and the way we should behave. But in this case, I departed from that and it really was because I felt unfairly treated and ill-used. So I think you may agree that's, that's a pretty trivial example. For the less personal, less trivial one, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But first I want to read you the last thing I'll read you tonight from George's writing from Progress in Poverty. I think he has some really good insights here uh, that address what we could call the dog-eat-dog -dog problem. Uh, he says, um, if people were accustomed to dine in eating houses as are to be found in the lower quarters of London and Paris, uh, where the knives and forks are chained to the table, they would deem it the natural, ineradicable disposition of man to carry off the knife and fork with which he has eaten. Take a company of well-bred men and women dining together, on the other hand, there is no struggling for food, no attempt on the part of anyone to get more than his neighbor, no attempt to gorge or to carry off. On the contrary, each one is anxious to help his neighbor before he partakes himself, to offer to others the best rather than pick it out for himself. And should anyone show the slightest disposition to prefer the gratification of his own appetite to that of the others, or in any way to act the pig or pilferer, the swift and heavy penalty of social contempt and ostracism would show how such conduct is reprobated by common opinion. All this is so common as to excite no remark, as to seem the natural state of things. Yet it is no more natural that men should not be greedy of food than that they should not be greedy of wealth. They are greedy of food when they are not assured that there will be a fair and equitable distribution which will give each enough. But when these conditions are assured, they cease to be greedy of food. And so in society, as at present constituted, men are greedy of wealth because the conditions of distribution are so unjust that instead of each being sure of enough, many are certain to be condemned to want. It is the devil catch the hindmost, or we could say dog eat dog, of present social adjustments that causes the race and scramble for wealth in which all considerations of justice, mercy, religion, and sentiment are trampled underfoot, in which men forget their own souls and struggle to the very verge of the grave for what they cannot take beyond. But an equitable distribution of wealth that would exempt all from the fear of want would destroy the greed of wealth, just as in polite society the greed of food has been destroyed. And so on to the less personal example. Uh, you know, I think the, the point here is that when we're driven to it by the, these kinds of conditions and this feeling of unfairness and fear of want, uh, I think none of us are immune from kind of acting out that dog-eat-dog -dog side of ourselves. And I can think of no better example than Henry George himself. So Henry George, I mean, here's a man that I admire uh, you know, just about uh, more than any has ever lived in history. He dedicated his life to understanding and solving the poverty problem and uh, I think had tremendous insights where he, he really kind of nailed it there and, uh, and, and therefore thereby benefited all of mankind. He was a humanist. Um, and, and, and this was the, his life's work. And yet, when he was a young man, relatively young and, and early on in his career, just making a name for himself, just trying to start out uh, to, to, to make something of himself, uh, he wrote an essay that was anti-immigration, and not just anti, but viciously so when it came to Chinese immigration. Uh, it was published in the Herald Trib New York Her Herald Tribune. Uh, it, it, he sent a copy to a man he admired then very greatly, John Stuart Mill, and got some positive feedback. And even though George in later life, uh, once he had later on had his central insight about the uh, poverty problem, the, the, the central role in poverty of 
unjust monopoly and particularly monopoly occasioned by private property and land. Uh, even though George then uh, came to have a completely different view of immigration and advocated, for example, in an article he published in 1888 for open immigration and felt under the influence of his insights that immigration is a benefit inherently to all concerned, the, the migrant as well as the host, the receiving country. Even, even though all of that is true, he never could quite go the whole way to getting rid of his prejudice, essentially racial prejudice, against uh, Chinese, you know, uh, Asian and African immigration. Uh, he could never see or foresee the kind of melting pot this country has become. And I think uh, he retained, till the end of his days, the vestiges of a kind of um, us versus them. They're taking our jobs, even though he, of all people, knew that that was not the case, and mostly felt it was not the case. Attitude, uh, which has more than a little tincture in it of dog-eat-dog. -dog. And it's my theory, my speculation, that that had to do with the fact that when he was young, uh, it was an anti-immigrant screed, an essay that gave him kind of a uh, start on the world stage, uh, plus whatever you know prejudices he had uh, taken in when he was himself struggling, not just to become known, but sometimes struggling uh, against falling into poverty himself, that I think uh, accounts for some of these attitudes that he didn't entirely get rid of. And so, uh, if it's true for George, how much more so for the rest of us? I think the fact is, even if my theories about him are wrong, I think the fact is that none of us uh, is immune from these tendencies. And so, here's my new conclusion to this longer version of this subject that I'm talking to you about tonight. As human interaction in society is by nature primarily cooperative, on the whole, where we see a significant and widespread rise of dog-eat-dog -dog behavior, as we're seeing today, we can take it as a sign, if further sign were needed, that distribution of economic opportunity has gotten badly out of whack, and that significant numbers of people in a society have been unfairly reduced to very low levels of opportunity indeed. The rise of dog-eat-dog -dog behavior is just another of many undesirable side effects of poverty and the poverty problem, and that much more reason for us to work as intelligently as we can towards solving the poverty problem. Thank you.